Okay, so today we want to see another algorithm that uh, relates uh, both to the page rank and uh, also to uh, linear programming and uh, probably a few other algorithms that we will cover uh, later. So just to show you that it's essentially just a few techniques that solve uh, a great variety of problems. And this is why they are really uh, worthwhile uh, uh, learning. So, uh, you know, when the mobile phones uh, appeared for the first time uh, in America, uh, the, I forget which company started them, but the business analyst predicted that the total demand uh, in the United States for mobile phones will be uh, at most 10,000, right? So uh, it is, uh, um, it is, you know, shows how hard it is uh, to predict the future of technology. In fact, I also met uh, Bob Lucky, who is a famous electrical engineer who invented the adaptive equalizer that is crucial for digital telecommunications. So what is an equalizer? <coughs> for example, if you have a copper line wired connection, then it acts, uh, it has inductance and it has also capacitance, right? So it acts as a low pass filter. So what comes out on the other end is uh, uh, a waveform that doesn't resemble at all what came on the front end. And in good old times uh, of uh, uh, just telephony, uh, you had uh, these uh, usually women in uh, these offices that was uh, uh, mechanically uh, tried to insert uh, um, inductors and capacitors to compensate uh, for the, to invert the action of the of the channel, right? But Bob uh, Lucky uh, found a way how the system, if it sends a handshake uh, uh, symbol, can actually equalize the channel, can compensate, can invert the action of the channel, right? To get back the original waveform. And in good old times, uh, if you've seen it in the movies, when you use telephone modems to connect your computer to a server, this funny noise in the beginning is actually a kind of fixed uh, signal that both the sender and receiver know and uh, uh, the receiver trains uh, its equalizer uh, knowing uh, what it should come out uh, at the end after. So anyhow, it was a fundamental without this, of course, digital telecommunication. And this happens also in wireless uh, uh, because the, uh, you have reflections from buildings, so several identi I mean, several attenuated and phase shifted copies come to the receiver, and this has effect, it's easily seen, of uh, changing the spectral features of the signal. So Bob Lucky invented a digital, uh, invented adaptive equalizer and uh, became famous, but uh, he was also working for the uh, Bell Labs, and when even internet started, uh, right, uh, they asked him to predict uh, if there is any uh, business model that one can make money out of internet, and he told them, no way, this will be used uh, to exchange emails and exchange files, but he couldn't see how uh, one can uh, um, use internet for uh, some business enterprise, right? So it's really hard to predict uh, the future um, of an invention. And uh, actually, just uh, recently, I saw ad for this iWatch 3. And to my utter amazement, uh, this thing can actually act as a mobile phone. So it doesn't, it no longer has to connect to your iPhone, but it can communicate uh, directly with the base station. Uh, 
and how they managed to do it from this tiny, dinky little battery inside. Uh, because your mobile phone can radiate about one watt of uh, uh, power, which is significant power, right? But this thing can radiate in millivolts, milliwatts at most, and I really don't know what kind of black magic they use, okay? But how does, uh, uh, how do mobile phones uh, work, right? Um, so the idea is uh, that it's based on the idea of a cellular network. So the whole space that has to be covered for connection is uh, broken into um, a uh, uh, hexagonal pattern, right? So you have another hexagon here, right? And then yet another hexagon here. Uh, and this is becoming less and less hexagonally. Okay, like this. And one down here. Here and of course also here. Now, so these are your in the centers of hexagons are your base stations, and base stations are depending on their position and available infrastructure. They are connected uh, to the backbone of the communication system, uh, either by, uh, by fiber links or by a microwave, direct microwave uh, communication of high capacity, of course, right? Now, uh, the reason why this is done is now you assign, so the whole bandwidth available to mobile phones, uh, you can then break it into seven distinct uh, sub-bands, uh, right? And you assign to each of the cell, uh, each of the cells a uh, frequency channel, say it is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, so that at the uh, channels uh, so that the users in each hexagon cannot uh, interfere. So if this is F min and this is uh, here F max, this is split into seven channels, right? So this is one, two, uh, three, or actually this uh, numbering is uh, a little bit trickier uh, because what you are trying to keep adjacent channels uh, uh, spatially as much apart as uh, possible. So probably this would be say uh, uh, five, this would be two, this would be six, uh, this would be uh, one, uh, and this would be, which one did I not use? Three, right? So now the distance uh, is uh, of between adjacent channels are uh, uh, as far apart as possible, right? But that's, you used up all your frequencies, right? So now in the adjacent uh, uh, cells, you have to start uh, re to reuse uh, the frequencies. So, say in this cell, you will have to use uh, 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 seven, right? But the idea is now all of the users that communicate with tower operating on frequency seven are much closer to the tower than to the adjacent tower that is operating on the same frequency, right? But, of course, uh, so the intensity of the signal, how does it depend on distance? Uh, 
what is the law? Squared. Squared, exactly. So it will attenuate uh, the signal here substantially more than here, but not completely. Right? So people that use, uh, uh, that are connected to this tower, will produce noise uh, for people who are connected to that tower. Right? But uh, so how, uh, uh, so the capacity of, the, uh, of a channel is determined by signal to noise ratio, right? Uh, and we know pretty uh, exactly by Shannon, uh, uh, Shannon, uh, Shannon developed uh, this uh, um, uh, theory, how is the information capacity of a channel uh, related to uh, the bandwidth uh, and um, um, so higher signal to noise ratio, more throughput you can have, uh, right? Uh, so let us now analyze this uh, for uh, a uh, um, particular uh, situation. So uh, you have a certain number of users. Uh, I1, I2, I3. Uh, oh, by the way, all the users that are in the same uh, hexagon, they use the same frequency, but they are kept separate in two ways. One is called time division, and essentially the tower assigns a time slot to each of the users and keeps switching uh, between the users. So your mobile phone, uh, first it heavily compresses your voice and then packetizes it and stores it, and then when his turn comes, uh, it dumps all the packets to the uh, to the base network and then and receives also uh, the the packets from the from the tower and uh, this keeps switching it keeps switching so it, everyone gets uh, its uh, share um, that's one way the other way is something with call which is called with uh, with orthogonal codes which are essentially how you can think about orthogonal codes. Uh, they are orthogonal vectors in a space, and each of uh, you is assigned an orthogonal um, uh, vector. And then uh, the base station simultaneously transmits information, but when you find the scalar product between the received signal and your uh, orthogonal vector, you will get only your component, right? All, compo all other orthogonal components uh, will be in your receiving end after you uh, find the scalar product. Uh, they will all be zeros because they are orthogonal to, uh, to your vector. So in any case, uh, <coughs> These guys do not interfere either because they operate in different time slots or um, use orthogonal codes, but you do interfere with users uh, in far, farther away uh, uh, cellular, you know, cells because you operate on the same frequency. So you can then imagine that these are your users. Right, uh, and uh, one of them is uh, in uh, uh, this uh, cell, the other is in that, someone else might be in an even farther cell away. So you can think of them as transmitters uh, and receiver, transceivers, right? Two, three, and in general, I up to certain number N, right? And then you have uh, the corresponding base stations here. So these are mobile phones, and these are uh, base stations. 
right? And now, um, one, two, all the way up to N. And now each base station receives the signal from the guy that it is talking to through a channel uh, uh, which has an attenuation G I I, but it also receives, uh, if this is not one, I should have done it, uh, okay, let me be more pedantic. Uh, so this guy here wants to talk to the base station I, and this, let's call it direct channel, right? Because they are in the same cell. We'll have certain attenuation G I I, but um, another here, say user J, will be also received by base station I, and it will have attenuation G uh, I uh, J. J is the transmitter, and I is the receiver. Assume now that they are, the mobile phones are talking to the tower in this direction. Now, this is actually not called channel attenuation, but for some, <coughs> I guess, historic reasons, it's called channel gain, even though, of course, it is much smaller than one, because the power, so how are uh, gains received? Uh, how are they received? So power received, right, is equal power transmitted, times the gain of the channel. <coughs> right? So, let us see. I'll do so what is the, uh, the what does the receiver I receiver receives well I receiver receives uh, uh, pi and uh, the transmit power of the I uh, sender right so this is I transmitter and here is the I receiver. Uh, times the gain, which would be, as I say, called attenuation, uh, of the channel between I receiver and uh, I transmitter, right? But besides that, it also receives uh, uh, the farther away guys, so it will be some of the transmit powers of everyone different than I, right, times the gain from I to J. So I is the receiver and so in G, I, J, I is the receiver and J is the transmitter. Right? So that's the total uh, uh, whatever uh, 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 total received uh, uh, signal, right? Well, what is, and this is usually called the signal to interference uh, uh, ratio, right, of the I communication channel is defined as uh, the signal, which is just this, uh, pi times uh, gii, uh, divided by uh, total um, interference, which is this part. Uh, so this is interference, and this is the signal, right? So we here divide by uh, 
j not equal to i power of the j transmitter times uh, the gain of channel between j transmitter and night receiver. But we also have to add, say, eta i, which is the noise. Where does the noise come from? The noise comes from radiation, cosmic radiation, uh, you know, all sorts of, uh, oh, you, you know, your power drill produces a hell of a uh, radiation, electromagnetic radiation. So, in fact, you have uh, a background noise and also you have thermal noise of the semiconductors in the receiver. And then, of course, noise is also produced by algorithms themselves because they have round off errors and do all sorts of approximations, right? So this is the useful component and this is the uh, kind of spurious, uh, the noise component. Uh, and now assume that you want to do certain communication. Uh, well, depending on the nature of the communication, whether it's just encoding of your voice or maybe uh, you are uploading a file, uh, depending of, um, and depending on the quality of your uh, equipment, uh, this signal-to-noise ratio to achieve the task has to be kept larger than certain coefficient gamma i. Right? So gamma i depends on all sorts of things like nature of the equipment and the task, communication task performed. And at the moment, we'll, we, we will assume that gamma i is known. And then later, we will actually figure out how gamma is determined in practice, right? Um, so what is your goal then? So the goal is to make your battery in your mobile phone last as long as possible. So you want to minimize the sum total of all radiated powers. Of course, this is also very good to minimize for other reasons, because uh, the whole network will produce interference on other communication channels, like air traffic control or that are adjacent in frequency, because even when frequencies are different, uh, there is leakage. Uh, Right? They are not entirely confined to uh, just a very narrow brick walled uh, bandwidth. So you want to minimize the total radiated power uh, subject to the constraint that each of these uh, SRI uh, oh, sorry, S, how did this, a signal to interference, SIR, I is bigger or equal than gamma I, and of course you have natural uh, assumption that, of course, to have communication, all of the powers uh, uh, PI have to be positive, right? So this is the goal of your network. And the advance of mobile communications was actually due to two things, um, especially for cellular phones. First, uh, you know, like when I was working at uh, Signal Processing Division of uh, Raytheon Corporation, uh, the, it was tricky to compress telephone to 32 kilobits per second because regular transmission if you sample with 8-bit analog to digital uh, converter, require 64 kilobits. Uh, and then there was uh, a big deal when a chip appeared uh, that uh, 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 compressed this signal to only 32 kilobits, uh, right? Um, now, at that time, there were sound compression, I mean, voice compression algorithms that could do a few kilobits only, but they were so monumentally complex. 
And at that time, uh, I remember maybe just one or two years before that, I was walking uh, uh, past uh, at, US, uh, at UC San Diego a library and there was this uh, um, PC rolled and the title was Speed Monsters, uh, 66 megahertz, uh, right? So now your mobile phone uses uh, cores that uh, are clocked at uh, more than one gigahertz. So uh, the main advance uh, happened when the chips uh, were sufficiently sophisticated to produce uh, uh, a, a speech compression to the size of just uh, a few kilobits uh, rather than 10 of kilobits. And the second huge advance was precisely this uh, power control, right? Because what happens, you know, what happens, the significance of this is this. You see, assume that I am, that you are on a party, at the party, right? And you are talking to someone, but there are heaps of other people around you talking to each other. So your uh, partner cannot hear you, so you start talking a little bit louder to overcome the noise of other people talking and the outside noise, right? So you start talking a little bit louder so that he can hear you. But as you start talking a little bit louder, then you become a little bit louder noise to other people. So other people start talking a bit louder too. Now your level of noise has increased, and so you start talking a bit even louder. And before you know it, this escalates and everyone is yelling, right? So that's exactly what happens uh, uh, to mobile phones, uh, right? If there is no some kind of global power control uh, that controls the power of everyone. But the problem is controlling by an algorithm power of everyone. Uh, whoever decides the powers, he would have to know all the gammas and all signal to interference ratio of everyone, then do some fancy computation and then send back a request at what power you should radiate. And this would impose a, a huge uh, overhead to the network. So the goal was to implement something that prevents these, uh, uh, you know, powers running out of control, but that is, uh, that is sufficiently simple that it can be implemented in a fully distributed way, in which you and your partner do something regardless of what others are doing, and somehow this turns out to be globally optimal for everyone, right? And it's absolutely non-trivial that something like that can be done. And so this is why the algorithm that I am going to present you, in fact, uh, solves uh, this problem in a really spectacular way. The algorithm is extraordinarily simple, as you will see, but justification why it works is highly non-trivial. And it's related to the fact why uh, page rank works in a sense. Uh, so this is what we want to see today. Okay. So let's see first what kind of a problem is this. Uh, so we have this ratio bigger than gamma, an objective that looks like this. Can you recognize what kind of problem this is? Uh, it's not per se a linear programming problem, but it is reducible to linear programming problem. How? We can multiply with the denominator and bring everything on one side. So let's see what we get. If we multiply, we get the following, that P i g i i, right? And then minus gamma times this, minus gamma i times the sum, uh, uh, which is j not equal to i, pj, gij, 
and then minus gamma eta i, minus gamma i uh, eta i has to be uh, bigger or equal than zero. And lo and behold, let's see, the, the variables are known powers that we want to find uh, what should be the proper powers are pi's. So, uh, uh, and uh, the constant term is this because you can measure the noise uh, and you know the gamma we are assuming at the moment. Uh, so actually we can put this back to the right and we can divide by pi and get, sorry, by gii and get the following nice expression, pii minus uh, sum j is not equal to i and then g i j divided by g i i right uh, times uh, uh, here we can put times gamma i right and then times p j has to be bigger or equal than uh, gamma i eta i divided by g i i. And lo and behold, this is uh, a, of course, uh, p i j, p, uh, p i's are all uh, bigger than zero. And uh, if we want to minimize, of course, minimize uh, uh, p1 plus p2 plus, plus p n. So we want to minimize a linear function subject to linear constraints because these are all constants, right? These are the attenuation of, at least they are constants within the time slot, right? Because the channel can change with time, unfortunately, especially in mobile communications, but at least at a given point, uh, you know, in a small interval, these are just constants. So it would look like as if we solved the problem, right? But how do we solve linear problems? Linear programs are solved, are not solvable in a distributed way. So still we would have to inform, say, the base, page, base station about all the gains, all the gammas, the base station would have to solve this, uh, uh, this uh, optimization problem and then transmit back the powers that uh, the transmitters should use. So that's still extremely impractical, right? So we have to look. But you see, if I was trying to solve this problem, at this point I would get discarded. Because, gee, how do you solve a uh, uh, linear programming problem in a totally distributed way. So uh, let us first uh, write uh, this program in matrix uh, form. Alex? Yes. What is the, what is attenuation? Okay, so I emit your power, uh, your phone emits the signal at, say, one watt. In the antenna of the uh, receive station, the power will be 10 microvolts, microvolts. So the channel attenuated by a factor of what, 10 to the 8. So it's like the factor by which the power... Received power differs from the transmit power. So these, that's a very good point, you see, so these numbers, right, are extremely small numbers. But still this number, GII, is uh, um, uh, larger than GIJ. So in the sum over there, you're trying to sum up the total signal received at the uh, base station yes. from exactly. all of the phones that are trying to exactly. connect to the base station. Yes. And so, so this is the one that carries information for me. 
which is from my partner, right? And this is all interference because it comes from farther away guys that use the same frequency band, right? So their powers will be attenuated by, will be multiplied by even smaller number. But what about all the people that are within the same hexagon? As they well? keep switching in time or use orthogonal codes. So they don't interfere with each other. So it, uh, how it works is the base station gives the time slot to each of you, uh, synchronizes the clocks, tells the time. Oh, so it's like alternating. And the, uh, yes, each user gets say 10 milliseconds uh, slot and then uh, waits for the next round when again it can both send and receive for 10 milliseconds. Uh, okay. Yes. Right. Now the question is, uh, how do we know, first of all, that these conditions, these constraints, have a feasible solution at all? Maybe there is no solution at all, right? So the, this, as we will see in a moment, uh, puts requirements on gammas, that gammas should not be too large. You should not require too large signal to noise ratio, otherwise there won't be one that satisfies everyone. Right? Yes? Sorry, on the constraint, um, why is it PIMI? Sorry? Is, but on the constraint, it's PII minus the sum. So PII is the... Ah, sorry, 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 sorry because, I'm, uh, okay. <laughs> because I'm half asleep. Thank you very much. It's PI, yeah? Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes, PI only. Um, okay, so let's write this in a matrix form. Uh, what would be, uh, let's write the constraint first. Well, if we introduce a, a constraint, I mean, if we introduce back the vector, let's call it one. So what is uh, one? It's a vector consisting of just ones. 